Hey everyone, what's going on? It's Mr. Harvey here. Let's get started with chapter 4 and we're going to be talking about the wars of religion. Okay, now the time period we're going to be focused on, ladies and gentlemen, is in the late 1500s, early 1600s. So let's get right into it. So, the wars of religion, ladies and gentlemen, obviously are going to stem from uh, Protestantism. Protestantism, we talked about that in the last chapter, chapter 3, Martin Luther, Calvinism, the English Reformation, there's been a lot of religious changes in Europe, and one of the major effects of these changes and Protestantism is we are going to see some fighting about religion, some major conflicts, okay? Um, one of the major fights we're going to be seeing is going to be dealing with the Spanish Empire, and we know this about Spain. A major opponent of Protestantism, very Catholic nation, very conservative in their religious beliefs, okay? And they are going to really try to stop pro uh, Protestantism, stop the spread of Protestantism, and we are going to see... Uh, them involved in many of our conflicts that we're going to be talking about. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is the uh, the French Catholics versus uh, the French Protestants, the Huguenots. The Huguenots are Calvinists, okay? And we'll be talking about these French wars of religion. Um, another conflict that we're going to be seeing is uh, the Thirty Years' War involving Germany, the HRE, and the Holy Roman Empire really, uh, you know, trying to reimpose Catholicism in Germany, kind of refighting those wars, um, that we saw with, that Charles V was in when he was uh, trying to reimpose Catholicism um, in Germany. So we're going to be talking about that. And then we're also going to be talking about um, the Netherlands, okay? And we'll, we'll be talking about that in the lecture with Spain because the Netherlands um, was, uh, during this time, ruled by um, uh, Spain. Uh, and so we're going to be kind of talking about that, uh, the rev that revolt in the, in the Netherlands. But today we're going to be really focused on the French wars of religion, okay? Now, before we get started, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in talking about the French wars of religion, I kind of want to go back to chapter 3 a little bit and talk about these Habsburg Valois wars. Habsburg being the family of the HRE. Um, Valois, right? French, okay? Now, these were five wars that are occurring during the 16th century, during the 1500s, between France and the Holy Roman Empire, okay? And you all might be thinking, okay, religious wars. Well, no. These were actually not religious wars because the Holy Roman Empire was predominantly Catholic, and we know that France is Catholic, and France was involved in these wars, and we know that France, in, in kind of reviewing chapter 3, France was getting involved in these religious conflicts for political reasons, and we know their political uh, objective and agenda was to keep Germany, you know, fighting itself, keep Germany, you know, um, disunified, all right? That was a very key policy of France. And these Habsburg Valois wars, ladies and gentlemen, were political in nature. France and the HRE were both Catholic, and France is doing this in order to keep the fight in Germany, keep them separate, make sure they don't unite, because we know that that was a major foreign policy objective for the French. So we do not classify um, these Habsburg Valois wars um, that are occurring during this, you know, time of huge religious conflict as, you know, religious wars, okay? Um, they were political in nature. All right, so not considered religious wars. Just a little bit of review and just kind of like uh, something for us to keep in mind as we talk about religious wars, okay? Um, but it's important for us to know the results of these Habsburg Valois wars. Okay, these wars are going to end with the Treaty of Chateau uh, Cambrises in 1559, all right? And what's important, ladies and gentlemen, is France in these wars, okay, kept the HR, uh, they kept, uh, you know, kept the HRE, kept Germany uh, from gaining power, total power in Germany and helped Lutheranism to spread, helped Protestantism to spread. And so France's objective was fulfilled, keeping Germany, all right, you know, not unified, making sure that they were not, you know, completely one cohesive country and on the same page. And this is important because if Germany is religiously divided, well, also going to be politically divided during this time. So that was very important for France, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Um, and this is something we're going to be talking about. France, um, you know, France is, you know, main political objective is to, you know, throughout history, excuse me, and we're going to be talking about this, is to make sure Germany does unite. I cannot emphasize that enough, ladies and gentlemen, because when Germany does unite, when that happens, it is going to be catastrophic for France. We are going to see the Franco-Prussian War. We're going to see World War I and World War II. Just major, major conflict will uh, uh, go down between the French and the Germans, okay? And so France, during this time, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm kind of setting precedent for these episodes later on in history that France, you know, chose this political issue 
a, you know, of a strong German state on its eastern border as more important than the religious unity of Europe. France, you know, knows that if Germany is united, that's going to, you know, be a big problem for them um, politically um, on the continent. Okay, so important results from the habsburg valois War. It's important for us to keep that in our mind because we're going to be talking about this relationship between France and the eventual emergence of Germany um, throughout this class. Okay, all right, let's get into these French wars of religion, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Um, and we are in the uh, the late 1500s, uh, we are in the 16th uh, century, okay, late 16th century, okay? So the French wars of religion, there's about nine wars fought between 1562 and 1598. 1598 is a date that we do need to know, we'll, we'll kind of get there in a, uh, a little bit later on in the lecture, all right? Um, but we don't need to know all these wars, okay? Just kind of know them, you know, generally as the French wars of of religion, okay? Um, very important for us to know that France is Catholic, and we talked about that in the Renaissance, right? Concordat of Bologna, France, you know, uh, solidified its relationship with the Catholic Church, a very strong Catholic country, um, and that is a very important part of France, okay? Um, and we're going to see this conflict in France between Huguenots, Calvinists, and Catholics, okay? This is, this is, that, that's kind of, these are the two groups, the two opposing sides, um, during these wars of religion, all right? And we're going to be uh, discussing a couple monarchs, that, uh, and I'll kind of go through that, but the two main monarchs that we need to know in this um, these wars of religion are Henry II, who's part of the Valois family, and Henry IV, or Henry of Navarre, who's going to be starting the Bourbon line, okay, the Bourbon family, all right? So Henry II, Henry, and Henry IV, make sure we highlight those two names, circle them, star it, we have that down. We need to know these, these monarchs. There's a couple other people that we will need to uh, know, but these are the two most important figures um, to take away from the French wars of religion, okay, especially when it comes to the monarchy, all right? Um, and what's important, ladies and gentlemen, is with Henry II, all right, uh, and his family, we're going to see the French monarchy really mounting an opposition um, to, uh, you know, Protestants and to, um, you know, some of these other religious groups. Um, but we're going to see the, the French monarchy kind of lose control of this situation. And we'll kind of get into that when we discuss the, uh, the French wars of religion. Okay, let's talk about this Valois family. Okay, Henry II was considered the last powerful Valois monarch. Okay, now he had three sons and Henry III will actually be the last Valois. Okay, but Henry II is going to be the, the last powerful Valois. Now, um, he's going to die um, uh, in an accident, I believe. Um, and his three sons are going to be kind of, you know, ruling at different times during um, uh, uh, during these French wars of religion. But the key figure after Henry II is um, gone, while the sons rule, is Catherine de Medici, related to the Med Medici family of Italy. Okay, uh, and she really controlled the sons. All right, um, and she. What's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, with Catherine de Medici? And you don't need to know all this. I'm just trying to give you some context and some background. Is that she's going to manipulate her sons. Obviously, she's the mom, so she has a lot of influence, um, uh, you know, a lot of influence with her sons, uh, and she's, you know, plays a, big, a, a large role uh, in their lives. Um, but she, she's going to kind of get, you know, her hand caught in the cookie jar a little bit in that she really is going to play both sides. You know, she's going she's gonna to kind of, um, you know, talk with the Catholics, talk with the Protestants, kind of get caught up in the middle and she's going to lose control of the situation and make some serious mistakes that we'll talk about, okay? Um, but, you know, we're, Catherine de Medici is important for us to know as well, okay? Um, she's really going to be um, a catalyst for making things worse uh, for her sons for and really, you know, the, uh, the Valois family losing control of the crown. She really lets this situation, the French wars of religion, really spiral out of control, okay? Catherine de Medici, all right? Um, and yet she will develop a reputation for cruelty, and we will uh, be talking about that, especially with uh, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Okay, and there she is, Catherine de Medici, the mother of um, the three sons, okay? Um, husband, or excuse me, wife to uh, her husband, um, Henry II. Okay, let's get ready to move on. All right, now... Uh, after Henry II is gone, the first uh, leader to take over of the sons is uh, Francois or Francis II. Here's his wife, Mary Stuart. If we remember her from the last lecture, this is Mary Queen of Scots, Catholic, Catholic. It's going to be really important for us to remember Mary Queen of Scots, um, uh, you know, being Catholic. 
Uh, her son will be James I of England, who takes over after Elizabeth. And he's going to try to reimpose some of that Catholicism along with his um, uh, uh, some of his family, um, which we'll get into kind of in chapter 5 a little bit. But there's uh, Francis and his wife, Mary, uh, Mary Queen of Scots, and Francis is going to die. Um, okay, here we go. So what's important, ladies and gentlemen, uh, during this is once Henry II is gone, we're going to see three families kind of starting to compete for influence over and within the French monarchy. And these three families are the Guise family, who are Catholic. Let's make sure we write that down. The Guise family are a noble family leading the Catholics, okay, trying to um, have some power within the French monarchy. We have the Bourbon family, okay, who is going to who are going to lead the Huguenots in the south. All right. And then we have the Montmorency uh, Chatelion. Okay, and I kind of abbreviate them with MC. All right, you don't have to write all them down. But the two main the two main families that we that we need to know, ladies and gentlemen, are the Guise and the Bourbon family. Okay, those are the most important. And a kind of a spoiler alert: the Bourbon family is going to kind of ta eventually take over the French monarchy, and that would be Henry of Navarre. All right. Now the Guise initially are going to start to establish control over the monarchy. All right. Um, and something that's important are the Bourbons. Uh, and Montmorency Chateleons are going to respond to this control by starting to develop Protestant sympathies, greater and greater Protestant sympathies. And what this is doing is giving them more public support. So more people will support the, the Bourbons and Montmorency Chateleons, uh, you know, for, you know, their kind of their fight for political power and political influence. And obviously, if they have, you know, a, a, a large following, that's going to make them very, you know, politically dangerous. And this is a political response. You know, the Bourbons and Montmorency Chateleons, they had Protestant sympathies, but they, you know, they weren't totally sympathetic uh, to Protestants, but they, they, they are going to develop these Protestant sympathies to, to uh, and these religious sympathies to gain, you know, a, a, and this is a political motivation, not necessarily a religious motivation. It's a political motivation for them to kind of gain more power. Okay, but we're kind of setting the scene for the big conflicts and, and the big changes that we're going to be seeing in France. Okay, so three families again, the Guise, the Bourbons, Montmorency, Chateleons, Guise, Catholic, Bourbons, Montmorency, Chateleon, uh, uh, Protestant. Okay, so and, 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 ha and Protestant sympathies and having a lot of uh, Protestant support. Okay, um, a couple important uh, Bourbons and Montmorency, Chateleons are Bourbon Louis the First, not super important for this class, uh, and uh, Coligny. Okay, some of our important Protestants. Let's move on. Okay, now, like I said. We're seeing these uh, these noble uh, aristocratic families um, joining, um, you know, these this movement for political reasons. Okay, we're seeing the Guise, uh, and the Guise are firm believers in Catholicism. But you know, the the Bourbons um, and Montmorency Chateleons are joining Calvinists and you know becoming more vocal for Calvinist uh, beliefs. Not necessarily, you know, to try to give religious freedom to all the Calvinists. You know, that's like I just said before, that's not necessarily their main motivation, but there's political reasons. And what I'm trying to uh, kind of, one of the reasons why I keep kind of repeating that, and that's important, is because when we talk about these religious wars, uh, religious wars ladies and gentlemen, is that we're not just going to see religious motivations playing a part in these religious wars, but there's political motives as well that's really important for us to account for. And a common question on the AP exam is uh, a question during this time of motive. And this has been, this was a DBQ a while back uh, on the 30 Years War, which we'll talk about in subsequent lectures. Um, but it's just something really important for us to be aware of, ladies and gentlemen, is the motives behind, you know, some of, the, some of these groups that we're seeing during these religious conflicts. Is it religious? Are there religious motives or are there political as well? So it's really important to, to be able to discern that, ladies and gentlemen. As we're seeing the Bourbons and Montmorency Chateleons get involved in this. Yeah, they have some Protestant sympathies, but there's also a political play as well. There's also politics involved as well. They want political power, okay? And they're and what we're seeing them, uh, you know, try to do is take power away from the monarchy, and eventually the Bourbons are going to take control of the monarchy. Okay. Now, Catherine de Medici, ladies and gentlemen, she Francois will die, okay? And her uh, her uh, other son, this is Charles. The let's remember our Roman numerals. What is that? Good, the ninth. Okay. Um, Charles the ninth is going to take over now. She wants France to be Catholic, okay? She wants France to be Catholic, but she fears the Guise influencing and gaining greater and greater, you know, power within the monarchy, within the government, okay? And so she's going to start to look for uh, uh, Protestant allies to kind of push back against the Guise, all right? 
Um, but she eventually is going to join the Guise out of fear after we, there's a massive Protestant uh, uh, massacre bef before one of the first wars. Now, is that really important? No, ladies and gentlemen. But what we're going to be seeing, ladies and gentlemen, and the theme that I want you to understand from this, okay, is that she does not she does not see friends in the Guise or the Bourbons. And she... In the, in the Montmorency Chateau Leon, but she's going to go back and forth with these groups and kind of play both sides, like I said earlier. And she's going to, you know, really lose control of this situation. And this situation is just going to get worse and worse and worse until eventually uh, the, the uh, Valois family uh, loses power and completely loses the throne. All right. So she she's really going to mishandle uh, some of the, uh, some of the um, events during this time, ladies and gentlemen. That's really what I'm trying to get at. Okay, the details, some of them are important and I'll kind of uh, uh, really focus on the important details. Okay, um, but I really want people to kind of understand how she mishandled the situation. Okay, so we start to see the wars, uh, you know, uh, break out um, in 1562. Don't need to memorize all of this. Okay, um, you know, the bloodiest war is going to be the third one. Okay, from uh, 1568 to 1570. It's going to uh, end with this Treaty of St. Germain and Lay. And remember, there's multiple wars. Do we need to memorize them? No. But understand, France is very unstable during this time. And we're going to see a lot of political and religious instability. And this, the, this, these civil wars, these, these wars of religion are getting worse and worse and worse. Okay? This Treaty of St. Uh, uh, Germain and Lay is going to um, kind of settle things down a little bit. And we're going to see uh, Protestant religious freedoms in uh you know, Protestants are going to have religious freedoms in their cities. They're going to have the right to fortify their, their towns and protect themselves. Okay. It's going to start to give the Bourbons, uh, Caligny, the Montmorency, Chateleons, a little influence in the monarchy, which Catherine does not want. And remember, she doesn't want that with the Bourbons and the Protestants, nor the Guise and the Catholics. Okay. And so she's going to go back to the Guise and ask for help to stop Protestants and their power, and more importantly, their influence on the crown. Okay, so she's going. She's kind of going back and forth, right? She asked for Protestant help, but then you know she went to the Guise. Now she now she's going, you know, back to the Guise after some of these wars have popped off, saying, "Hey, help us, help us." But you know she doesn't want them to be, you know, super involved in the monarchy. Yet she's asking them for help, right? So we're we're gonna see this situation kind of get worse and worse for Catherine and her family. Okay, all right. So the Saint Bartholomew's Day massacre is super important, ladies and gentlemen, and this represents one of the gravest mistakes of the Valois, and re really illustrates and symbolizes Catherine losing control of this situation. Okay, Catherine is going to be in a panic uh, with the Protestants influencing her son. There's a failed assassination on Caligny, all right, and she's going to convince her son to execute Protestant leaders. Okay, and now the situation in France is going to get extreme and just crazy and just lose, France is just going to lose control of itself, all right? And uh, over, you know, a period of a couple of days in August of 1572, Caligny and Protestant leaders and Protestants are going to be just butchered in the street. And, you know, an estimated 20,000 Protestants are going to be killed. Um, and this is going to put Protestants on high alert, like, oh my God. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like this is this is this is wild. Like whoa. Like this is this is they, the in Protestants all over are not just fighting for religious, you know, freedom anymore. They they they're fighting for survival. They're fighting for like their life. Like it, it, you you're seeing Catholics and th this is a picture from it. Just 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 fighting in the streets, butchered in the streets. Like the the, the chaos in the streets. Like this is just mayhem. Okay? Um children being killed, the elderly being killed, people being killed in places of worship. Like this is a massacre and this is going to alarm Protestants all over Europe. They are not just fighting for their religious beliefs anymore. They are fighting for their lives, okay? And this is a fatal, fatal mistake uh, by Catherine, okay? this, this, And this really symbolized, ladies and gentlemen, her losing control of the situation, okay? Going out and having, you know, her son order the murder of the Protestants, that's just going to make things, you know, worse. It's just kind of pouring gasoline on the fire and things are now worse uh, in France. Okay, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And as you can tell from this picture, ladies and gentlemen, just brutal, just a brutal, brutal event. Just the Protestants being massacred in the streets. Terrible. Okay, let's get ready to move on. 
Henry III. This is the last of Henry II. It's the last Valois. Okay, remember Henry II, very powerful Valois. His three sons that followed, okay, Francis, uh, Charles, and this is Henry, right? Um, Henry, this is Henry the Third, ladies and gentlemen, is the last Valois, okay? Um, and you know when he, um, you know, t took power, okay, the the monarchy was very much uh, in in uh, in perilous times, okay? Uh, it was trapped between the Guise uh, and the Huguenots. Catholics and Protestants are fighting it out all over. Uh, it, it is it. He, it is just chaos in France, and things are really, really bad. Now, eventually, we're going to see him try to calm uh, things down with this piece of um, uh, Bellieu, a treaty that granted, you know, Huguenots uh, freedoms, okay? Um, but the Catholic League is going to force, the Guise are going to force Henry, um, you know, to end this treaty, all right? The Catholic League will force Henry to, you know, to, no, hey, no, no freedoms for the Huguenots. And again, this is just showcasing, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, the, the Valois family not really having control over the situation, okay? Uh, uh, eventually, the Catholics and Huguenots are going to begin fighting again. Oop, I added S. Sorry about that. And I think my grammar up here was, was poor too. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and the Ca Huguenots are being led right now by Henry of Navarre, and he is the heir to the French throne, okay? I believe he is uh, some type of relative um, to uh, um, uh, Henry III, and he has some type of claim. Um, to uh, to the throne, um, but Henry the Third has no kids. Okay, and so Henry Navarre is the heir to the throne, as uh, Henry the Third has no children. Okay, and with Henry the Third being assassinated, Henry Navarre is going to be able to take the throne. Okay, he, and he is going to become Henry the Fourth of France and defeat the Catholic League. Now, Henry the uh, of Navarre, very important. We need to highlight his name, circle his name. Super important, ladies and gentlemen. He is vital. We need to know him because he's going to be equivalent in um, uh, uh, importance to um, Queen Elizabeth. Okay. All right. And here's a picture of Henry IV entering Paris. Very important. Okay. Let's talk about him. Okay. So he, Henry the, uh, of Navarre, Henry IV of France, we've got to know him for the AP exam. He is the first Bourbon monarch. Okay, and we're going to talk about some very important Bourbon monarchs in France: Louis the Fourteenth, who says "I am the state, the Sun King," and Louis the Sixteenth, um, where the French Revolution starts under him. Okay, and he's going to be he's going to be executed with Marie Antoinette. Um, but Henry the Fourth, ladies and gentlemen, he's he's a Protestant. Okay, he has Protestant sympathies. He fought on behalf of the Protestants, and when he becomes king, he is going to make, he's going to be faced with a huge huge decision to make. Do I? Stay Protestant, okay, and the fighting will continue, or do I convert to Catholicism and, uh, you know, try to calm things down? And he decides to, you know, renounce Protestantism and convert to uh, Catholicism, and he did this to make a compromise. He did this to make peace between, uh, you know, everybody. The, 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 the Catholics were very suspicious of him, and this is going to help the Catholics chill out. He's going to convert to Catholicism and say, hey, you know, I I will you know convert Paris is worth a mass and that's that's his that's his famous quote okay Paris is worth you know a mass it's 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 I'm gonna put my you know his personal religious beliefs aside he said he's gonna put his you know his Protestantism he's gonna renounce it become Catholic in order to calm things down okay and to really to really um, bring the two groups and the two sides together. Okay, and that's that. This is an example of him being a politique, much like Elizabeth. And this is a very common compare and contrast, ladies and gentlemen, is Henry Navarre and Elizabeth. All right, um, you know, very similar, right? Let, let's kind of go back to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, Protestant. She, remember, she made her Anglican church a little Catholicly and a little Protestant. You know, with her Elizabethan settlement. Henry Navarre is doing the very a very similar thing. Okay, he is renouncing his Protestantism, converting to Catholicism in order to calm things down in order to make sure that the that, that these wars stop okay and that the, the, these conflicts stop um and, and so he's putting his country before himself and you know paris is worth a mass okay it's worth like what he's saying there it's worth going to mass in order to save paris okay putting he's a politique putting the interests of the state uh, before his religious uh, considerations okay um he's uh he's going to gain the royal inheritance okay uh, but what's really important, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 
you know, the Protestants are sitting there like, um, dude, like, uh, what about us? Um, you know, he is going to, Henry Navarre is going to pass the Edict of Nantes in 1598, and uh, this is going to grant religious rights to the Huguenots. So, you know, it's it's not going to be perfect for the Huguenots, and, and actually the Huguenots are not going to be super happy with him um, because they, they, they kind of want more, they want full equality. Um, um, but Henry Henry knows that, you know, France is a Catholic country, okay, and he's going to do his best to try to calm tensions down between the Huguenots and Catholics. He, you know, like, and he, one of the ways he does appease is uh, the Catholics is uh, by uh, you know converting Catholicism, but he also knows that he he, he needs to help the, the Huguenots as well, and and so um, this is Henry Navarre really trying to calm things down, and he does that through his conversion to Catholicism and his uh, Edict of Nantes. Okay, very important, and we need to know the Edict of Nantes. Highlight that, circle it. Very important. Fifteen ninety eight. Okay, um, but it does not grant religious freedom for all, and it didn't give you know the Huguenots you know full equality. Okay, complete equality, but they, it did give them some religious rights. Okay, let's move on. All right, yeah, and like I said, the Edict of Nantes, you know, it, it was it was a truce. It's gonna, uh, you know, recognize uh, minority religious rights, the freedom to publicly worship, right to assembly, admissions to universities, uh, public offices, permission to maintain fortified towns. Um, but it wasn't, you know, the Huguenots, you know, the Huguenot, the Huguenots definitely wanted wanted a complete equality um, and, the, and uh, Henry Navarre will be unwilling to do that uh, because uh, you know he's he again is worried about Catholic backlash and it is because France is a, a complete Catholic country um, but he, he will try to kind of calm things down and create a truce and that's what the finance is uh, is definitely for okay all right important for us to kind of uh, uh, remember about the French uh, Civil Wars ladies and gentlemen some of our major effects. One, France remains a Catholic country, okay? Royal power has been weakened drastically. We now have, ladies and gentlemen, a new family in the French monarchy. That is going to be the uh, the uh, the Bourbon family. Very important for us, ladies and gentlemen. The Valois family is gone, okay? Um, uh, and it's gonna let, we're going to start to see the, the, uh, the foundation for absolutism in France, okay? We're going to start to see, and we'll talk more about that later in Chapter 5, we're going to see Henry of Navarre, we're going to see um, uh, Louis XIV really, you know, create a strong, absolute monarchy that eventually will be lost um, in the uh, French Revolution. But, um, you know, we're kind of getting there. Okay, we're, kind of, we're, we're, we're on our way there. Okay? All right, let's stop there for today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to, in the next lecture, I'm going to be talking about Spain and kind of what's going on with them during these religious wars. And the very last lecture of Chapter 4 will be the Thirty Years' War. Okay? All right, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day.